Hello friends, Handjammer here. In this episode of the Rusty Beats, we continue our fun with the 10D 1000TL2 which I presented previously. So without further ado, let's get started. We will start the upgrades with expanding the memory from 640 kilobytes to 768 kilobytes. We need 4 44 64 100 or 120 nanosecond chips, 32 kilobytes each. You can get them from graphic adapters like Hercules clones and some EGA cards. We will use these two broken cards. Just remove the chips from the sockets or desolder them and it's ready. The 1000 TL2 uses 16 to 128 kilobytes of installed RAM for the graphics adapter. This means less conventional memory is available for programs. An additional 128 kilobytes for use by the graphics adapter frees up the base memory. The installation of the chips is as simple as pressing them into the sockets on the board. Instead of a hard drive, we will use a CF card installed in the XT IDE CF controller. The controller must be configured using DIP switches, so that the I.O. and ROM addresses do not collide with the addresses already used by the computer. For 10D1000TL2, I.O. address 300 and ROM address D800 are suitable. Installing the card is as simple as inserting it into the PC bus slot. As a floppy disk drive, due to the failure of the original drive, I will use the GoTech emulator, a favorite among enthusiasts of vintage equipment. I modified the drive connector by removing the pins to which the power is connected in 10D1000 computers. Detailed information on this subject can be found in the Adrian's Digital Basement video about 10D1000HX. The link can be found in the description. Gotex casing slightly collides with the front panel of the computer. The solution will be to design an appropriate case for the drive and print it in 3D. The original floppy drive ribbon cable has four connectors, three IDC and one edge connector for the five and a quarter inch floppy drive. The IDC connector next to the five and quarter inch drive connector must be connected to the motherboard. More on that in a moment. The strip on the ribbon cable of the hard disk and floppy drives must be on the left side of the computer when looking at it from the front. It is extremely important. Reverse connection may cause damage to the floppy drives and computer. Unlike in the earlier 10D1000 models, the stripe means pin 1 of the connector, just like in a standard PC. And in the case of the GoTech, it must face the power connector. We will use this AMP to Berg adapter to power the floppy disk emulator. As I mentioned in the previous episode, the original Sony drive stopped reading floppy disks. What's worse, I finished it by connecting it incorrectly, which can be clearly seen on the electronics. I quickly managed to buy a very similar model on a local auction service. The electronics are almost identical but the important difference is the traditional way of powering it with the bare connector, not through the ribbon cable, as expected by the 10D1000TL.
To adapt the new drive to work in 10D1000 TL, we need to modify the electronics. The PCBs are almost the same, but there are a few differences. To make them easier to spot, I took two macro photos and superimposed one over other. The SMD components used by the manufacturer are very small. Thanks to the photos, I didn't have to use the magnifying glass to compare both PCBs. After a short while, it is clear what needs to be changed. The arrows indicate the components that has to be moved. Rem is to remove the component and add adding one. The reverse side of both PCBs is the same and doesn't require modification. The same applies to the floppy motor control boards. Let's quickly test the boards with a multimeter. In the new drive, all the pins in the bottom row are ground and are connected to each other. Just like in all typical PCFDDs, as shown in that diagram above. I only check all the pins because only differences apply to them. In the original floppy drive from this computer, the connections are as shown in the diagram above. This is consistent with the 10D1000 floppy disk drive ribbon cable pinout. It's time to make changes to the board. I use a soldering iron with a small tip and tweezers with the bent tips. I desolder the elements using only a soldering iron. I do not use a hot air blower in this case. The whole operation requires some precision and a good magnifier glass is useful, but it is not too complicated. Just be careful not to damage the pads on the PCB. This is how the PCB looks after the modification and before cleaning it from flux. Before cleaning it, check if the changes made had the desired effect. If so, the new drive's connector should have the same pinout as the original drive. It is exactly like the original floppy disk drive. It's time to clean the PCB from flux residues. We use pure IPA and an anti-static brush for this purpose. The end result the PCB looks almost like from the factory. And here is what caused the problem in the first place. When disassembling the computer, I didn't notice that the previous owner of the computer connected the floppy drive ribbon cable the other way around, just like you can see right now. I reconnected it incorrectly only for the demonstration purposes. The connector that was plugged into the floppy disk drive should have been connected to the motherboard. This caused the floppy drive could be connected the wrong way around. Only one of the connectors was correctly positioned. While testing the drive after the initial failure, I connected it to the second connector, which caused further damage. As you can see, the ribbon cable has two connectors with the notch oriented like in a standard PC for connecting two 3.5 inch floppy drives and one with the notch on the other side. This one goes to the controller. After the cable is properly reconnected to the motherboard, let's test the modified floppy disk drive. Hopefully, there will be no magic smoke this time. It looks like everything is okay. One remaining thing is to check if the drive is working. It certainly gets the correct power and reacts to floppy disk read requests. Unfortunately, the servo of the head doesn't even try to move it. So at the moment, 
we have to use GoTech and I will hunt for the correct 21000 TL floppy drive on eBay. In the meantime, I have already ordered adapters from Derek Osborne on Tindy. Link in the description. To easily connect a GoTech or typical PC floppy drive to the 21000 TL. So matching another similar Sony drive should not be a problem in case I can't find exact model we need. Enough tinkering with the hardware. Let's see what this machine can do. For such old computers I usually use 520 MB or 1 GB CF cards. First run and immediately a problem. It's related to the XT IDE CF card because before this card was installed the computer started out correctly. Changing IO and ROM address settings didn't brought any improvement and I spent a lot of time trying figuring it out. The address 378 indicated in the error message is typically used in the PC by the parallel port. Finally, I figured out that the specific PQI CF card I used was to blame, although it's fully functional and works without problems in other computers. Therefore, we will ultimately use larger 1GB transcend card. Much better already. The computer starts up and reports the memory size. 768 kilobytes indicates that it correctly detects the extension we installed earlier. The card is blank, so the DOS installed in the computer's ROM boots up and the deskmate graphical interface is started. The computer doesn't have the setup program installed in the ROM. Instead we have the setup TL2 exe program loaded from the boot floppy. The slash A switch gives us access to the advanced options of the program. In the setup we can configure floppy drives informing the computer in which bay they are installed. It doesn't really matter for a single drive. On the next screen boot properties such as computer speed, boot device, display type, amount of memory used by the graphics chip and more are configured. It is also possible to go deeper with the hardware configuration, including turning off or turning on individual controllers and weight state settings for memory, CPU and video controller. We do not use the integrated XTA disk controller, so it will remain turned off. We also have localization settings like DOS code page and the type of keyboard used. It's also possible to disable and enable programs available in the machine's ROM. After changing the settings, another restart and it's time to install DOS. I chose version 5.0 because it supports partitions up to 2GB and its release date, 1991, is closest to the computer's production date. Let's speed up the installation process a bit. Another reboot and MS-DOS 5.0 welcomes us with the MS-DOS shell. I will transfer the rest of the software to the card using a modern PC. Out of respect for your time, however, I will skip showing this process. And it's ready. For a full retro computing experience, we will test how this computer works using a Tendi CM11 color monitor. The monitor has some problems maintaining vertical sync. The V-hold knob helps, but it's very sensitive. This may be due to the fact that it's adapted to be supplied with a 60Hz current and right now it's powered from the 50Hz mains. The first game we will try is Test Drive 3 The Passion. In addition to the 10 graphics mode, the game also supports the computer's free voice synthesizer. The Passion was the first three-dimensional installment in the series. Personally, I was very disappointed with it. The game seemed empty and boring compared to the previous games.
The music generated by the 10D chips sounds much better than on PC speaker. The built-in speaker offers decent volume and sound quality. The 8 MHz processor of the computer can hardly cope with 3D graphics. In practice, this title is unplayable. However, I suspect that 30 years ago it wouldn't have prevented me from playing it. Another title similar to the Test Drive 3 is Stunts, also known as 4D Sports Driving, a title developed by DSi and published in 1990 by Brother Band. The game also supports the 10D1000 IBM PC Junior sound generator. It sounds decent, but works very slow in full details. So let's change the graphics detail settings. It's much better now. The game, despite the low speed of the processor, is quite playable. Another title from Brother Band, Prince of Persia. The advantage of this game is that it supports the full range of both sound devices and graphic adapters. Hence Prince is a must for testing old hardware. The graphics adapter of the 10D1000 is the same as in the IBM PC Junior. In practice, it is CGA with additional modes, including 60 color graphics mode. The graphics looks exactly the same as in EGA mode. The audio is much better than on PC speaker. The music sounds similar to the Creative Music System card, and the sampled audio sounds just as good as on the Sound Blaster. Another title that we will test is The Overkill, space shooter from Epic Mega Games. For some reason, I have never had the chance to play this title before. Yo, 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 yo,
The LHX Helicopter Simulator from Electronic Arts is a title I spent a lot of time on. Despite the simple graphics and sound, in some respects it surpassed the Gunship 2000. The sound on Tandy 1000 differs significantly from that on the PC speaker and Adlib Sound Blaster cards. The game, even in full details, works decently. And one more fly simulator, the F-15 Strike Eagle 2 from Microprose. The sound generated by the 10D chips in this title is very good, and the graphics look almost the same as in EGA mode. Finally, let's take a look at the DeskMave desktop environment developed by the Tandy Corporation for its computers. DeskMate was originally developed for the TRS-80 computer running TRS-DOS, like the Amiga Workbench or Jam, and the first versions of Windows for PC, it is not a separate operating system, rather a graphical shell. It relies on MS-DOS providing the user with a friendly graphical mouse-driven interface. Tandy 1000 TL2 has a version 3 of this interface in the ROM. Basic applications such as an address book, calendar or a simple graphic editor were read from the free floppy disks supplied with the machine. The applications delivered with the computer are very intuitive and user-friendly.
When using Deskmate embedded in the computer's ROM, we are faced with juggling floppy disks. The solution, of course, would be to install the environment on your hard drive. I must admit that the standard software bundle provided with the Deskmate actually met the needs of people for whom the machine was to be a basic help in organizing their daily tasks. An example is a calendar that allows you to save appointments and set reminders. In practice, its functionality is very similar to what we use today, for example in Microsoft Outlook. In 1988, Tandy Corporation launched a PC Link, a paid online service for users of its computers equipped with the Deskmate graphical interface. PC Link, operated by the Quantum Computer Service of Vienna, Virginia, allowed the use of several different services via modem connected to the telephone line. Of course, today PC Link is no longer available, but on one of the floppy disks we received quite an extensive demo, guide, showing its most important features. Let's take a look at them for a moment. The most important features of the service were of course related to maintaining relations between Tandy Corporation and its customers. So we had the opportunity to use a help desk called our hotline, a database of frequently asked questions, a guide to additional software or an online store. PC-Link made it possible to try and buy software from the largest publishers such as Activision, Electronic Arts or Brother Band and communicate directly with them. What's more, it was possible to share comments and even chat online with people who already purchased this software. Of course, it was also possible to chat with PC Link users about other topics. Some of these features were available as part of the PC Link Plus Premium service for an additional 10 cents per minute which is the equivalent of 20 cents today. The cost of the service itself was 9.95 a month or about $20 today adjusted for inflation. This didn't include fees dependent on the telephone line operator. For more creative users, Deskmate comes with music and draw software.
Both programs were quite simplified. However, they didn't differ much from competing programs available on the market at the time. And it is not without significance that we received them for free. This version of Deskmate also included the game Hangman. Of course, this is in the entire program library for this GUI, because it includes several hundred applications, both available for free and paid, including such serious titles as Quicken, Lotus123 or Q&A Write by Semantic. Deskmate is a very functional and friendly graphical interface, at least for the time in which it was created. I can imagine that some users of the 10D1000 machines were using it exclusively, never switching into DOS. A huge library of knowledge about 10D computers and software for them can be found at the TV Docs archive website, link in the description. Tendi 1000 TL is a very interesting machine. This particular machine still requires some work, which includes adding monitor door and floppy disk drive and a second 3.5 inch drive mount, but we will deal with it in a while. For today, it is enough playing with this computer. See you online soon.